Good evening. Our topic this week is our Adventist identity. And tonight we want to explore perhaps the most important text in the book of Revelation regarding Adventist identity. And the interesting thing about this text is this is not one that is widely understood or known today. But it was perhaps the single most important text. Our pioneers, when they saw this text, they came to understand that here you could find the uh, people of God themselves, the final group of people. Begins in Revelation 10 and verses 1 and 2. And it says that I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. Now, just taking a quick glance at that, it looks pretty murky, doesn't it? Kind of hard to understand. But the first thing I would like to point out is that in this text, you have a number of key words that remind us of something in the Old Testament. You notice here, for example, the word angel, the word scroll, and the word open. If you go to the back part of the book of Daniel, you will find this language there too. It tells Daniel to write the words, put them into a book, and then seal up the book until the time of the end. Uh, just a note for the people here, this only seems to be shifting slides. It's not making the moves within the presentation. I'll try to work with it, but we need to work on that uh, later on. All right, so what you would have seen if we were getting the whole presentation is a text of Daniel 12, verse 4, where you see this idea of sealing up the text. And in sealing up the text, Daniel's message is kind of hidden for a time until the end of the world would come. So in Revelation 10 verses 1 and 2 is an allusion to Daniel 12. It's not an illusion with an I, but it's an allusion with an A. In other words, uh, when Revelation writes chapter 10, you're expected to have Daniel 12 in mind. All right, so it would seem that in working through Revelation 10, Daniel 12 is to be kept in mind. And now we come to verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the angel I had seen, standing on the sea and the land, raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, the sea and all that is in it. And he said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Now the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. And so the characters in the book, the objects in the book, everything in the book has deeper meaning than what is there on the surface. On the surface it's like a cartoon. And a cartoon can talk about incredible things and yet it's just a cartoon. And Revelation is kind of like that. It's a cartoon fantasy, if you wish, that is designed to teach something much, much bigger. So here you have an angel who's big enough to have one foot in the sea and the other foot on the land. I get the impression it's not just standing right at the edge of the water on the beach, but that this is a really big angel who's kind of straddling, you know, one foot in New Zealand, the other foot in the middle of the Tasman Sea. You know, that's really big. All right. It highlights the text right here. It says, there will be no more delay. There will be no more delay. May I ask the folk in the back booth, if you can advance it from now on, uh, just by hitting the space bar on my computer, uh, that would work better, because we're going to miss a little bit too much uh, working with the, the remote. All right. Yes, thank you. Okay, and I'll give you a little signal whenever we need to move. This term delay 
It says there, there will be no more delay. This is the NIV, I believe. That's an interpretation. You know the translations of the Bible often have to interpret the Bible in order to make sense in the translated language, and that's, that's legitimate. But uh, as we work with the original text, sometimes we discover there are things there that the translation doesn't quite bring out clearly. So the uh, delay here, the concept there will be no more delay, is an interpretation. This angel is announcing something. And what is it that the angel is announcing? He is announcing that time will be no more. Thank you. All right. The Greek literally says chronos. That's an English word too now. Chronology. You see, that's the study of time. Chronology. The Greek here literally says time will be no more. NIV interprets there will be no more delay. Okay, what's going on here? There's an angel standing, gigantic angel standing on the land and the sea. Angel so big. He doesn't fit into New Zealand, so he's got to have one foot dangling out in the water. Okay, big angel. And he's making an announcement, perhaps one of the most important announcements in the history of the universe. And he says, there will be no more time. Well, what's that all about? Can we understand what that is all about? It's a strong allusion to Daniel 12, 4 through 7. Let's take a look at it. You, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. And by the way, you've probably heard this. This running to and fro, that's not about people driving in cars and riding in airplanes. I didn't fulfill this prophecy when I flew to New Zealand. All right? It's actually the eyeball running back and forth through the text. If you go back to the original Hebrew uh, in Daniel, that is the case. So it's many will go here and there to increase knowledge. It's they're going here and there in the text of Daniel. They're studying the book of Daniel carefully. So Daniel, right now your words are going to be sealed up. There's things in the book of Daniel that nobody's going to understand until the time of the end. All right Now this is important to really grasp this. Adventists have come into the world at a time when we believe that the messages of Daniel and Revelation are going to come clear. And they become the foundation of who we are as a people. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. All right? So you have an illusion here. Revelation 10 is building on Daniel 12. Notice this. We follow the text. Revelation 10. The angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Look at Daniel 12. The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and left hand toward heaven. I heard him swear by him who lives forever. All right, now on this screen here, it's not entirely sharp, but can you see how close these texts are? Now, it might not impress you if you thought the book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament all the time, but it doesn't. In fact, nowhere in the book of Revelation is there a quotation of the Old Testament. The book of Revelation always alludes, it hints to the Old Testament. Usually it's just one word or two words, maybe a phrase. That's all. You see, you can point people to a whole big story with very little information if you want to. All right? Now let me give you an example. With one word, I can bring to many of your minds a whole giant story. You want to hear the word? Okay. It's this. Monica. 
You haven't forgotten, have you? Shame on you. <laughs> All right. But do you notice, with one word, there's an entire story that affects not just one woman, but a whole nation and, and a whole system of government and so forth. You see, that is illusion. The book of Revelation doesn't quote the Old Testament. It just drops hints like that. A word here, a phrase there. When the book of Revelation, let's just go back if we can. Uh, just bring back Daniel. Thank you. When the book of Revelation uses seven or eight words from the same Old Testament text, this is unusual. This is a big signal waving, saying, hey, you better take the Old Testament into account here. Normally, it's just a word or two. So when you see what looks almost like a quotation, it's not a quotation, because the angel in Daniel puts both hands up. So in, in an American football, that's a touchdown. You see? But uh, the angel in Revelation raises his right hand. The other angel raises both hands. So there's differences here. You're not quoting. Yet it's clear that Revelation 10 has Daniel 12 in mind when it, when it does this. We'll take a look now at this next item. Comparing Daniel 12 and Revelation 10. They both give a location that's on land and sea. In both cases, the right hand is raised to heaven. In both cases, an oath is sworn. All right? So whatever's going on in Revelation 10, it wants you to have Daniel 12 in mind. Do you see that? But here's where we get to the interesting difference. All right? In Daniel 12, when the angel raises his hand and swears, what does he say? Time, times, and half a time. A period of time, 1260 days, three and a half years. When the angel of Revelation 10 raises his hand and swears, what does he say? There will be no more delay. Time will be no more. No more chronos, no more chronology. Now what impression do you get just looking at that? If Revelation 10 is recalling Daniel 12, what is the message? It would sound like, doesn't it to you, that whatever time period Daniel 12 is talking about, in Revelation 10 it's coming to an end. Do you see that? Now, it, it, it takes a little bit of work to get through texts like this, but it can be tremendously rewarding. When you make a discovery like this, hey, he's got Daniel 12 in mind, and it's saying something important about Daniel. Apparently, in the book of Revelation, the angel is signaling a point in earth's history when the time periods of Daniel will come to an end. You're beginning to see why our Adventist pioneers thought this text was so important? Let's go further into it. Summing up. All right. You have a sealed scroll in Daniel 12. You have an open scroll in Revelation 10. Do you think there might be a relationship here? Daniel was to be sealed until the time of the end. Revelation, you quote Daniel 12 and you show an open scroll. So Revelation 10 seems to be saying, this material is about the time in history when Daniel's prophecies are coming to an end. All right? You have an angelic oath in both of these texts, so there's a connection between them. Revelation 10 clearly is building on Daniel 12. All right? There's a, what I call a structural parallel. You know, sometimes in the book of Revelation, you're building on an Old Testament book repeatedly all the way through. Did you know that the book of Revelation builds on Ezekiel? Uh, chapter 1 of Ezekiel is alluded to many, many times in Revelation 4. When you get to the end of the book, the New Jerusalem, that's built on Ezekiel 40 through 48. And all the way through, Revelation keeps alluding to Ezekiel. So it's, it seems almost as if Ezekiel is a structural parallel to Revelation. The two are working side by side. Revelation 10 is clearly building on Daniel 12. So the question is, is it the time to open the sealed prophecies of Daniel? Is Revelation 10 signaling the world that the book of Daniel is now going to be understood? That's the way it looks to me. Well, let's take a little closer look. And let's ask the question, what are the sealed parts of Daniel? 
Anyone have an idea? What are the sealed parts of Daniel? Particularly the time prophecies based on Daniel 8, 9 to 14. Now here's something that many people haven't seemed to notice. But in the book of Daniel, you have a pattern of prophecy and explanation. Prophecy and explanation. In Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar gets a vision. All right? But does he understand it? No. So Daniel comes and explains the vision to Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 7, Daniel gets the vision, angel comes and explains it to him. In Daniel 8, he gets a vision, angel comes and explains to him. Now, uh, follow this. There are other parts of the prophecy in Daniel 8 that are immediately explained in chapter 8. But there's one part of Daniel 8 that is not explained. All right. So Daniel 12 is a key text because Daniel 12 explains the things in Daniel 8 that have been left until then. See, time and again, Daniel gets a vision in chapter 8, but time and again an angel comes to explain to him. He comes at the end of chapter 8. He comes in chapter 9. He comes in chapter 11 to explain things to Daniel. And Daniel 12 then becomes a key text, the climax of a sequence that begins in Daniel 8. So when the book of Revelation picks out Daniel 12, it's not just quoting Daniel 12. It's got a whole big section of Daniel in mind. There's one New Testament scholar. His name was C.H. Dodd. He was British. Okay, so some of you can relate to that. And uh, he made a very important observation about the New Testament. He says when New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, they're not quoting it as proof texts. They don't want you to look at that Old Testament text and say, aha, that's what we're talking about here. Have you ever noticed when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, sometimes you have no idea why? What does this have to do with anything? It's because, Dodd said, that when they quote the Old Testament, they quote it to call the whole context to mind. In other words, they want the reader to remember the whole Old Testament and what was going on in there and how that part fits into it. When Daniel 12 is quoted, it's not because that particular text is the whole thing, but it's because it wants you to have the whole context of that part of Daniel in mind. So I'll show it to you this way. All right, this uh, rectangle here represents Daniel 8, Daniel chapter 8. And there's a portion of Daniel 8, verses 9 to 14, that is a visionary part. And you're all probably familiar with the idea of 2300 evenings and mornings and so forth. That's got a long Adventist history. So there's a vision about time. And there's four issues that are addressed in this text. First of all, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? There's a question. How long is it going to take? What's the answer in the text of Daniel 8? How long is the vision? 2,300 evenings and mornings. That's a whole separate issue we won't get into tonight. All right? So how long will will the vision be fulfilled? And the vision is concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the trampling underfoot of the sanctuary, and the host. These four issues come up in the vision, but they are never fully explained in Daniel 8. Here's Daniel 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, all represented by rectangles here. Here you have the vision of Daniel 8, 9 to 14. Remember there's four issues addressed there? Angel comes in Daniel 8, and uh, verses 15 to 16, he explains about the first parts of the vision. Verses 1 to 8, he explains about the ram and the goat and the four horns and so forth. And then he says, now, coming to the vision... It will last a long time. Now, 2,300 evenings and mornings, that's a long time. So, at the end of this text, he's finally getting to the key part of the vision. 
that 2300 evenings and mornings, that long time period, he gets to it and what happens to Daniel? He kind of passes out. All right, he can't handle all that time stuff. So the angel has to wait and comes back about eight years later in Daniel 9. Comes back 24, 27. He says, okay, now I've come to explain to you the vision. The vision of verses 8 through 14. Daniel 8, 9 to 14. I've come to explain the vision to you. And Daniel listens a while, but it still doesn't cover the whole thing. And then, in chapter 12, once again, angel comes back in chapter 12, 5 to 13, and it is there that it finally addresses the issues of Daniel 8. So Daniel 12, 5 to 13, is a very important text in Daniel because it is only there that Daniel finally gets the full explanation of this vision in chapter 8 that's so important. So when the book of Revelation quotes Daniel 12, it has this whole visionary sequence of chapters 8 to 12 in mind. So as you study Daniel, keep in mind this is an important background for everything that's going on in Revelation 10. Whoops, how did we do that? Let me get back here. Okay, there we are. So Daniel 8 has four issues, remember? How long is the vision? What about the daily sacrifice? What about the rebellion? What about the trampling underfoot? And in Daniel 12, every one of these four issues is addressed. How long? Talks about 1260 days, 1290 days, 1335. Talks about the daily sacrifice. Talks about the rebellion. Talks about the trampling underfoot. When the author of Revelation decides to quote from Daniel 12. He is quoting from that part of the book that summarizes all the key issues of the vision of chapter 8. So whatever you want to do with Daniel 12, right, don't forget it's part of the vision of Daniel 8. It's not some separate thing at some other time in history. When the author of Revelation says, time will be no more, He's talking about the whole scheme of prophecy in the book of Daniel. See, the Adventist pioneers came to believe that the Adventist church was made up of people that God had called to bring Daniel and Revelation to light in the last days. This is part of our mission, understanding these books and bringing them to people's attention. Okay, coming back to Revelation 10, verses 5 to 7. Here's that angel who says, uh, who swears by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and so on. He says, there will be no more delay. Time will be no more. All right? The phrase, as I said, no more delay, in the Greek, time no more, means that the time prophecies of Daniel have reached their conclusion. So God, seeing that the time prophecies of Daniel were coming to an end, calls into existence a people who are to bring these messages to light, who are to alert the world to the fact that God is doing something big in the world. We are entering a special period in history. There will be no more delay. Time will be no more. Now... If it was up to you and me, what point in history is this? What would you think? Just looking at what we've seen so far. Don't don't talk to me about what you've learned from the past. All right, but just looking at what we've seen this evening. What time would it be talking about that all these time prophecies come to an end? It sounds like the second coming, doesn't it? It sounds like the end of the world. That's exactly how William Miller saw this. This is where William Miller's mistake came in. William Miller said, time will be no more. Daniel's time prophecies come to an end. That means at the end of the 2300 days, in 1844, Jesus will come, take us all home. And it was intense, just like this, that Miller preached all over North America about the impending coming of Jesus based upon some of these very same texts. But you know, Miller missed something. He missed one little piece of the text. 
And uh, Ellen White seems to suggest that God was behind that blindness, that God had a purpose in allowing things to go the way that they did. That's an interesting thought, by the way. Does God ever permit people to be mistaken for a good purpose? Does God permit people to do stupid things in His name and sometimes bring them to a good conclusion? You know, say, um, God is more tolerant maybe than we are, and He's certainly bigger-minded than we are. It's amazing. Uh, the more you get to know about God, the more amazing He becomes. But God placed in this book thousands of years ahead if Miller had truly looked, he would have seen it. Notice what it says. There will be time, no more. No more delay, but. Did you see that light up? But. Now in the Greek, this word but behind here is a really strong one. It's a but that says, forget everything you've heard up until this moment. Now I'm going to tell you the real deal. That's the kind of but this is. There will be no more time, but... In the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So it seems as if the author of Revelation is saying, time is no more. Time is going to run out, yet it's going to go on. There's going to be an additional period of time after time runs out. In other words, the ending of Daniel's prophecies will not be the end of the world. But rather, one would expect the end here, but instead, when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. When does the end come? When the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, not when the angel here raises his hand and swears, time will be no more. The time that is no more is prophetic time. It is prophecies regarding a period, periods of time within history. When the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. So there will be a period of time between the close of Daniel's prophecies and the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the end of the world. Do you see why our Adventist pioneers got excited about this text? Because first of all, they believed they were living in a time when the prophecies of Daniel were being fulfilled, were coming to an end. They knew that by what reason? By calculating through history. They came to the conviction the prophecies were coming to an end. Here in Revelation 10, there's a text that says, okay, when you get to that time, here's your instructions. Isn't that great? When you're working on a model airplane or something like that, there's a whole piece of instruction that makes no sense. But as you're working on it, you get to a certain point in the project and suddenly it says, now that you've come to this part of the project, now these instructions will make sense. You see, that's what Revelation 10 is all about. When you get to the place where you know the time prophecies of Daniel come, on to, come to an end, now follow these instructions. They were excited to discover that the Bible prophesied a period of time when Daniel's prophecies would come to an end, there would be a set period just before the second coming of Jesus. That's one reason our pioneers got excited to believe Jesus' coming is soon. A lot of our Protestant friends believe that Jesus is coming soon, but they believe that we've been in the last days of earth's history for 2,000 years. So soon could be pretty long. But if we are living in the very last period of history, if in the countdown of earth's history we are in the last second of time, so to speak, then it is with greater conviction we can talk about the end being near. So our pioneers got really excited as they studied this text and said, look, we are in that period of time. Daniel's prophecies have closed and there's just one last period of time before Jesus will come. In the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So what's going to happen during this last period of time? The mystery of God is going to be finished. Now who do you suppose 
is going to be doing that except the people of God that recognize they are in this last period of history. See, the special role God has given the Adventist church is to recognize certain things going on in history that only those who know prophecy can understand. What is the mystery of God that will be accomplished? This word announced is actually the verb for gospel. It's euangelicin. That means the good news is being preached. The mystery of God is a way of speaking in the New Testament for the gospel. And here he says the mystery of God will be finished as he announced, as he gospelized, as he spoke the gospel through his servants, the prophets. In other words, this period of history, from the closing of Daniel's prophecies until the end, will be taken up by what activity? Preaching the gospel to the world. And when the preaching of the gospel comes to an end, what do we call that? The close of human probation. Revelation 10 then tells us that at the end of this earth's history, there'll be one final period, a period after the closing of Daniel's prophecies leading up to the close of probation. And the task of that period is one final proclamation of the gospel. So here we have a, uh, an illustration, a chart, and here we see the movement of history. This is a timeline of history. And history is divided by Revelation 10 into three periods. There's the period of Daniel's time prophecies, beginning all the way back in Daniel's day and moving up to the year 1844. Then there's a second period of time this period between the close of Daniel's prophecies and the close of probation. The third period of time is after the close of probation, the period of the seventh trumpet angel. When is the gospel going to be proclaimed? Throughout periods one and two. The gospel is proclaimed, but it comes to its end with the sounding of the seventh trumpet when the mystery of God is finished. So you see, Revelation 10 sees history divided into three parts. And where are we today? We are right in the middle of that. Revelation 10 is the unsealing time of Daniel. It's the time of the end. Why do Seventh-day Adventists exist? It is because we have recognized certain messages in Scripture that wouldn't be preached otherwise. We are living in the time of the end. The people of this earth re need to realize that these are very momentous times. I think a lot of people do realize that. When you look at the tremendous amount of apocalyptic in contemporary culture, whether it's movies or TV shows or music, the popular culture is full of the end of the world. You see, that's one of the major themes in popular culture is the end of the world. Combine that with the idea that God has set this period as the final period of earth's history. And it gets very exciting. You can see why our pioneers became extremely excited about Revelation 10. Here's a quotation from Ellen White, 7 B.C., 971. This time, she's talking about Revelation 10. This time which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history. Neither of probationary time, but of what? Prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So Ellen White understood this text very clearly. It's not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about the end of Daniel's prophecies and the things that are to happen in the last period of earth's history. Once again, looking at this chart, we see the process of Revelation 10, the three periods of history. Where are we today? We live between the no more delay and the about to sound. 
That's where we are. Now, this isn't time speculation. It's not suggesting that maybe Jesus is going to come next Wednesday or in February or in 2005 or any date like that. It is simply recognizing that what we do know clearly from Scripture is that we are living in the last stage of earth's history. And God has called a people. This is part of our identity. We are a people who are here to help everyone understand that this is a momentous time. And one way uh, with the younger generation that you can work with these things is to begin with some of their popular culture. And recognizing that in today's world, it seems like everybody believes the end is at hand. And if that's the case, could it be God moving the rocks to cry out? The end is at hand. And as young people growing up today, wondering if they'll ever reach adulthood. These are secular young people in your country, wondering if they'll ever reach adulthood, the terrorism and, and, and nuclear bombs and everything going on around the world. Popular culture is catching up with the book of Revelation, which has been telling us for over 100 years that this is the final period of verse history. We live between no more delay and about to sound. We cannot predict just when Jesus will come but what do we know for sure? We are in Earth's final era. And this should have the best of our attention. What then is our task? If we know that we're in this final era, if God has called us as a special people to be aware of these things and to bring them to people's attention, what are the messages we are to give them? The interesting thing is, this text doesn't leave us in doubt. Revelation 10 and the early part of chapter 11 spell out exactly what the Advent message is supposed to be. And this is very exciting because you have scriptural basis for knowing what is the message that we're to speak. Our pioneers actually believed that the Adventist church itself could be seen in this text. Uh, let me know if you agree with them. It says, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go, go. Take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel. Who is I? This would be John, the, the prophet, the one who receives the vision. I went to the angel, asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Sounds like one of those sugar cones. Okay. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. See, now our Adventist pioneers believed that this was a parable. John was acting out a prophetic parable of the experience of those people who would be alive when Daniel's prophecies came to an end. And what would be their experience? Great disappointment. Why? Because they thought that the closing of Daniel's prophecies in their day would see the coming of Jesus. And it didn't happen. They were disappointed. And so this acted parable comes in the context of earth's final era. So perhaps it is a message about the great disappointment. But notice what John is told in verse 11. After he eats the scroll, after he gets a sour stomach... Then he's told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. What is John to say? He is to prophesy again. How's he going to do that? John is dead. How's he going to prophesy again? Through his book. So what will be a crucial part of the message of God's last day people? Book of Revelation. What else will be a crucial part? The book of Daniel, which is unsealed at the closing of his time prophecies. So Daniel and Revelation are at the heart of the identity of this people. It was interesting that in the conversations that we had with the Lutheran church, we found agreement on nearly everything that mattered. Even on the Sabbath, while well, they were not ready to concede, 
that Saturday was the true day of worship. They were quick to concede that Lutherans as a whole don't keep Sabbath very well. And they asked us to help them understand how do you, how do you keep Sabbath? They were thinking Sunday, of course. They're saying, we need your help in helping to restore you know, a religious experience in Europe, for example, that people would once again take the laws of God seriously. They recognized that we had a voice in there that would be helpful to them. But the one thing we could never agree on was Daniel and Revelation. You see, because some of those things uh, were a bit too pointed and a bit too sharp. And so that did not connect. It is a special message that God has left to us. And as I said to them on that occasion, all right, you don't buy into this. But if we are right, somebody's got to give this message. And if you don't give it, then it's up to us to give it, right? And the fascinating thing is they extended the hand of fellowship. They said, while we don't agree on these things, we recognize that God has called you to a special task and, and that you are to give that for God. I thought that was, that was a beautiful thing that they did. Then I was told you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. This reminds me of finishing the gospel in verse 7. The message of Daniel and Revelation combined with the gospel is the heart of the message that we are to give as a people. But there's more. A final explosion of knowledge, not only of the gospel, but the gospel in the context of Daniel and Revelation. Chapter 11. What else will characterize the final message? I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go, measure the temple of God, the altar, and count the worshipers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Right after John is told he must prophesy again, what takes place? He gets a message about what? The temple of God. The heavenly sanctuary. So right at this point in history, where there's to be messages about Daniel and Revelation, there's a message about the sanctuary in heaven. And a little later on this week, I'm going to share with you the sanctuary in the book of Revelation. There's some fascinating new work on the sanctuary in Revelation that you've probably never heard of before that opens up a new vision of what the sanctuary is all about within the context of Daniel and Revelation. Our pioneers looked at this text and realized that God was calling us to a deeper understanding of Daniel and Revelation and of the whole concept of the temple of God and the sanctuary in heaven. Let me summarize then. What is the basic message that God has called this people to give? Here's a summary. I see some of you taking notes. You probably want to get this down. Because right within the scripture, this is an amazing thing. Can any other denomination say that they can go to the scriptures and find exactly what they're supposed to teach? That was what got our pioneers excited. It gets me excited to share it with you. First of all, Revelation identifies the time of the end. So at the cornerstone of the message is that we have come to the time of the end. So the message we give to the world is time is not going to go on forever. Time is not going to go for thousands of years. You know, we're not going to be here until the sun burns us to a crisp. God is going to bring things to an end a lot sooner than that, very soon. In fact, we are in the final stage of verse history. That's the first part of this message. Second, this final period runs from the close of Daniel's prophecies to the close of probation. So we are in that last period of history. Third, we are to proclaim a message that has three characteristics. First characteristic is the gospel. We are to understand and teach the gospel. And this is the part where we had a lot in common with the Lutherans. All right? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we share the gospel if we don't know what the gospel is? Adventists have often had great difficulty with the gospel. One thing I've tended to notice through the years in Sabbath school quarterlies, and I hope you can't find it in the one I wrote, 
but uh, if you're careful, you might, okay? Because it comes natural to us as the people. Every time an Adventist says, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. What is the next word? But. Okay? I've noticed that through the years. I've been studying the quarterly. I'm not going to tell you how long. <laughs> but uh, it's more than 30 years. <laughs> I've already given that away. <laughs> All right? I've been studying this lesson for more than 30 years. And it seems like every time the gospel is clearly stated, comes but. That doesn't mean that, you know, you're not supposed to obey. Now, I'm not against obedience. But obedience is not the gospel itself. Not our obedience. It's Christ's obedience is the gospel. And if we're not clear on the gospel, then everything else is messed up. I want you to be clear. And later on this week, I'm going to share a presentation of the gospel, which people tell me makes it so clear you can't miss exactly what's going on. I want to share with you exactly what it is God has done, how we can receive it, how we can know that we have eternal life, be right with God. So central to our message is a clear presentation of the gospel. Second, a focus on Daniel and Revelation. And third, a focus on the heavenly sanctuary. Is there any other denomination that is teaching all three together? There is none. That doesn't mean that other denominations have no purpose in God's plan. It doesn't mean that a Lutheran can't lead somebody to Jesus Christ, or a Roman Catholic even, lead somebody to Jesus Christ. That's not what we're about, telling everybody else that they're out because we're in. You've all heard that joke about somebody being introduced to heaven by St. Peter? There's a lot of these going around. But this one, I think, just this tickles me, you know, because it, it, it helps us laugh a little at ourselves. And uh, this fellow is get, getting a tour of heaven from Peter. And uh, first of all, he gets to this, this beautiful place where there's a whole bunch of people jumping up and down with their hands in the air. The fellow says, well, what's this? Well, this is Pentecostal heaven. And he says, and they're all excited, you know. And then there was another part of heaven where there was lots of water around. And people were swimming and everything. Well, this is Baptist heaven, you know. And everybody's uh, just having fun in the water. That's what Baptists do. You see, and, and so he was going on through different parts of heaven, and suddenly they saw a great high wall. And he says, uh, what part of heaven is this? He says, he says, this is where the Seventh-day Adventists are, and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> you see... I'm glad we can laugh at ourselves, you see? Because I think sometimes we give people the impression, you know, we're the only ones here, okay? God has, like Elijah's day, you know, the Elijah message, Elijah heard about 7,000 people he didn't know about that were following the true God, all right? So there's many people out there following the true God, but nobody else has this role to play. We have a unique purpose in the plans of God. And if we are not fulfilling the purpose, don't expect the Lutherans to do it for us. They made it clear. We expect you to be who you are. That was a very beautiful thing. We expect you to be who you are. And the work of God will not succeed if Adventists aren't being Adventists. You see? It's okay to teach the gospel clearly. It's okay to understand what Luther understood. You see? And there are others that are teaching the gospel and leading people to Christ. But there's a message that God has called us to give that I don't hear anybody else giving. And if we shy away from it, who's going to give it for us? My challenge to you tonight is to relearn, restudy, rethink if necessary what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, who we are as a people, and then find your place. Be who God called you to be. And you know what? There's nothing more exciting than being where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. And if that's why he's called you here to this tent, then I invite you tonight to rededicate yourself to the mission that God has called us to do.